Good day, and welcome to Epstein Becker Green and Provident Healthcare Partners webinar, Consolidation in Dermatology, Key Business and Legal Considerations for Dermatology Groups. Before we begin today's presentation, please be informed that you are welcome to submit questions throughout the program by using the Q&A feature provided by WebEx, and at the end, with, the, uh, with time permitting, the speakers will address your questions. You are also welcome to submit questions directly to the presenters following the webinar, and contact information will be displayed at the end of the presentation. We are pleased to have three fantastic speakers today. Epstein Becker Greens, Anjana Patel, mem member of the firm and the healthcare and life sciences practice, AJ Shaker, Vice President at Provident Healthcare Partners, and Stephen Grassa, Analyst at Provident Healthcare Partners. At this time, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Stephen. Thank you, Whitney, and, and thank you all for carving some time out of your, your afternoons and mornings to join us today. Um, as Whitney mentioned, I'm Steve Grassa. I'm an analyst at Provident Healthcare Partners. Uh, we are a um, transaction advisory firm that specializes in healthcare services transactions, and so uh, we represent shareholders of groups that are looking to explore a transaction process. So whether that's by way of raising private equity capital or aligning themselves with a strategic acquirer, um, we only work on engagements within the healthcare services arena, so we're you know, very well versed in um, the complexities of the healthcare services universe and, um, and have a pretty good pulse on the buyer community and um, you know, know the groups that are uh, both financial and strategic groups that are you know, sensible options to partner with at the end of the day. Um, you know, we've, adopt, we've evolved and adapted to the changing M&A landscape and you know, as such, we have carved out a niche within the physician service world as there's been an increased appetite um, for physician services business within healthcare services. We've closed 42 physician service deals since uh, 2014. And in most cases, these are groups that are founder and owner operated businesses that haven't taken on institutional capital or haven't undergone a transaction process as of yet. Um, so that involves a lot of upfront education on our part in terms of getting folks comfortable with with the concept of private equity that's created a buzz, you know, in some of these some of these specialties, um, and specifically in dermatology. We are a we're a national firm, so we're headquartered in Boston, and we have an office in LA as well. So we bookend the country in that sense, which which makes us geographically agnostic in terms of some of the engagements we take on, um, tracking consolidation trends throughout the country as they occur. Uh, this is AJ Shaker speaking from Provident. Um, <clears throat> we've also developed as a part of our experience and expertise within the physician services world, really a, a dedicated focus um, and um, you know wealth of experience within the dermatology space as a result of completing four transactions within the sector. Um, our first transaction involved advising a group in um, the greater DC metro marketplace called the Dermatology Center. Um, they went through a private equity transaction with a firm called Pharaoh's Capital Group. Um, we also completed another transaction about a year later in Maryland um, with a group called Derm Associates uh, that served as the um, Mid-Atlantic Beachhead for U.S. Dermatology Partners, which is a Texas-based organization. In um, 2017, we completed a, a transaction in which we advised adult and pediatric dermatology, which was uh, headquartered in Massachusetts through its platform investment from uh, Wad Capital Partners, and most recently represented uh, Dermatology and Surgery Associates, uh, a practice headquartered in the Bronx, New York, through their private equity transaction with Bell Health Investment Partners. Um, as a result of some of our work within the dermatology space, um, you know, we've not only educated a number of dermatology practices around what's happening within their respective um, uh, geographies and within the sector overall, and given some of the most commonly asked questions about uh, what the environment looks like from an M&A perspective and you know, typical questions around uh, what transaction structures look like for a practice of their size and scope, um, we uh, were able to gain a lot of experience in addressing the, some of those questions and we're hoping to translate that over uh, to our webinar here today. <clears throat> 
And uh, with that, I'd uh, like to pass it along to Anjana for uh, an overview of Epstein Becker Green. Thanks, AJ. Um, Epstein Becker Green, uh, just a little bit about our firm. We are a national firm with about 14 offices throughout the country, 250 lawyers, of which 120 are healthcare lawyers, and 70 of us focus uh, solely on healthcare transactions. And what makes us unique uh, from other national firms is that we have essentially two practice areas healthcare and life sciences and labor and employment. And because of this focus, um, we have depth and breadth in all things healthcare, and that kind of makes us a one stop shop for healthcare transactional work, healthcare regulatory compliance issues, healthcare reimbursement, healthcare lobbying. Um, and, and things like that. So our transactions team has significant experience leading um, major healthcare company mergers and acquisitions, affiliations, joint ventures. Our clients uh, are both national healthcare companies, uh, public and private, uh, private equity backed healthcare portfolio companies, um, and also local and regional healthcare providers and, and companies, including large physician practices. Um, and with that brief uh, overview of Epstein Becker, let me um, just kind of go over with you what the goals of the presentation are for today. Uh, AJ and Steve will talk about the recent wave of dermatology um, uh, consolidation transactions, and also you know how to go about evaluating um, different transaction structures. And then I will kind of uh, spend a little bit of time on the healthcare regulatory issues uh, that that come up in these transactions. So uh, with that, let me turn it over to AJ to get it, get us started. Great, thanks, Anjana. I think the most common question we receive from um, dermatology practices is, you know, why are we seeing so much consolidation and activity within the dermatology space today uh, versus at any other point in the uh, in the recent past? Um, on slide nine, what we've attempted to outline is um, some of the reasons, or at least one primary reason as to why we're seeing so much consolidation activity today. And it really, um, you know, comes from a position where private equity firms who have really led consolidation in healthcare over the past several years are looking to replicate the success they've had in previous physician practice verticals. And we've seen private equity invest in areas like anesthesia and dental for, you know, almost 20 plus years now at this point uh, with groups like TA Associates and, and Summit Partners uh, leading the charge in those respective sectors and a number of current private equity portfolio companies in existence in those sectors today. Uh, we've also seen, you know, those initial sectors of physician service consolidation translate into other verticals more on the outpatient and retail side of things, including areas like um, vein treatment and pain management uh, with groups like Center of vein, for Vein Restoration and Advanced Pain Management receiving private equity funding in the late 2000s. Um, because of some of the similar dynamics, not only from a physician practice management perspective, but also uh, growing these organizations through de novos, acquisitions, and introductions of other service lines, uh, dermatology really became uh, apparent as one of the new sectors in practice management that could uh, replicate some of these previous successes experienced by private equity in other physician specialties. And we saw that the first transaction within the segment uh, really of uh, note and repute happened with advanced dermatology and cosmetic surgery when they raised private equity capital from Audax Group. Um, that transaction really triggered a, a number of other, um, you know, add-on transactions to the advanced dermatology and cosmetic surgery platform, but also other private equity investors noticing that there were a lot of favorable macroeconomic trends and also regional trends that could really lend it themselves to creating uh, a new wave and consolidation within dermatology. And actually, as kind of an interesting count, uh, point, Along with that, some of the investors that we saw uh, were early movers within the dermatology space actually replicated some of their own successes in other areas such as gastroenterology and urology among others. Um, but I think as a whole what we've seen is that um, private equity has really seen the success of groups like Audax Group who have grown advanced dermatology and cosmetic surgery to one of the largest 
uh, players within the dermatology space and also uh, the returns they received on their invested capital when they ultimately exited their position and use that as kind of a, a case study for also replicating uh, a similar model with other dermatology practices in other parts of the country. And I think it's important to note that from a maturity standpoint, you know, although dermatology is a little further along than some of these other specialties, there's still plenty of runway left when you look at just the, the fragmentation of the industry. Which transitions to the next slide. Some of the dermatology consolidation drivers that we're seeing, and you know, the first one mentioned here is the fragmented, um, the heavily fragmented industry of dermatology, where you know there are 25 private equity-backed groups that account for around 10% of total market share. The four largest platforms account for about 2% of, of total market share, and so you know, this is the fragmentation is extremely attractive for the private equity, you know, buy and build model of rolling up and consolidating smaller practices with the ultimate intent of exiting at some point in the future. The next two uh, categories we have are, you know, macroeconomic tailwinds that are further driving volume growth within the sector. You have a growing acceptance of cosmetic procedures, a growing awareness of, of the importance of, of skin health, and increasing prevalence of skin cancers by way of you know, more biopsies and more Mohs procedures um, as the demographic continues to age. And couple that with the supply and demand imbalance, and you have a, a, a sector that's, that's very ripe for consolidation. Um, and then with healthcare getting bigger and, and more complex with MACRA and MIPS, um, and the administrative burden of running a practice increasing, you know, we're seeing a lot of business owners that are more willing to take on further investment to meet the infrastructure demands of, of a new healthcare landscape or, or align themselves with a strategic entity that has robust back office systems that they're able to plug into. And then the last, the last um, category we have here is favorable payer mix. So dermatology obviously is, you know, very stable and, and well reimbursed um, from, from a procedure standpoint and there's also a very heavy emphasis on cash pay cosmetics, which helps to diversify um, revenue streams away from reimbursement risk that's inherent in physician services. Moving on to the next slide, um, touching on the value of, of a private equity partner. This is obviously, you know, a buzzword that's been used many a time in the dermatology sector as of late. Um, the private equity overview, they're essentially um, investors that are making direct equity investments in private businesses. So you have institutional investors, think pension funds, endowments, and charitable organizations who are committing capital to these funds who are then investing them in private businesses that align with their investment theses and with the ultimate aim of growing these businesses financially and, and operationally to eventually exit their position at some point in the future. There are a lot of common misconceptions that come with um, you know, the, the concept of, of private equity. And I think, you know, AJ mentioned that, you know, consolidation in investment from private equity firms has been happening in a number of specialties for years now, and they've come to realize through their successes that clinicians are really the lifeblood of the organization. And um, it's important to keep doctors and physicians incentivized to continue to produce and happy with their situation. Um, a common misconception is that private equity groups come in and, um, you know, we'll, we'll steal autonomy from physicians and, you know, that's simply not the case in most cases. Um, private equity groups, you know, understand that they're not operators of the business and they're there for, you know, more board level strategic decision making and, um, and are there, and are there to, to leverage the current management team and uh, administrative staff in place to, to, to aim to grow the business, not cut costs. Actually, oftentimes you'll see margins come down quite a bit um, upon investment from a private equity firm um, as opposed to immediately reducing costs because, you know, they're infusing these businesses with, um, with capital to invest in infrastructure, to, um, to, to build de novos and increase regional density, execute an add-on acquisition strategy where they're rolling up smaller practices, again, with the ultimate intent to, to exit their position at some point in the future. On the next slide, um, you know, we've seen 
this private equity model really coalesce with a number of dermatology practices. Uh, like I mentioned, you know, some of the initial uh, pioneers within the dermatology private equity partnership universe were groups like Advanced Dermatology that started out uh, with about 53 locations, um, mostly clustered around Florida, uh, and utilizing the resources of um, their private equity partners, first Audax Group, then Harvest Partners, uh, to grow to where they are today, which is about 195 locations and a, a very national footprint. Um, you know, we also saw groups like U.S. Dermatology Partners, which uh, previously went by Dermatology Associates of Tyler, um, go through two iterations of private equity backing, uh, first with Candescent Partners when they were around four locations, and currently up to about 92 plus, again, very national in their scope today. And what we've outlined is that um, each star on the uh, timeline in green represents uh, a event where a private equity firm invested into a dermatology practice. And as I mentioned previously, and due to some of the macroeconomic trends that Steve mentioned, uh, we've seen private equity firms become very successful with a buy and build model where they initially partner with a, a platform organization, um, add additional service lines, increase the infrastructure investment within the business, and also make add-on acquisitions to bolster either existing geographic footprints or, or move into new areas of the country. And especially when groups like Audax Group, uh, Prairie, uh, Prairie Capital, as well as Candescent Partners made significant returns on their invested capital when they ultimately sold the, their positions within uh, their various dermatology uh, platforms. Uh, it really triggered a, a series of follow-on investments where we saw activity really ramp up in 2016 uh, with a number of private equity firms making investments into dermatology practices with the goal of replicating that strategy. And what we've seen so far in 2018 is a, con a continuation of private equity firms investing into dermatology platforms uh, and really think that over the next few years we're going to see this pace of consolidation continue albeit there's probably going to be fewer platform investments just because uh, there aren't very many groups of size and scale out there in the market that are still independent and could serve as a, a private equity platform themselves. But I think what we'll continue to see is uh, private equity firms who have already invested into dermatology practices uh, make uh, deploy additional capital into making acquisitions of smaller regional organizations and even larger private equity firms uh, potentially recapitalizing or acquiring the positions of some of the, the private equity firms currently invested into the sector. And moving on to the next slide, touching on why practices are per pursuing private equity. What are, what are the benefits of doing a transaction with a private equity group or with a private equity backed platform you know, one, from a, from a business standpoint, there's obvious there's the obvious access to capital that comes with doing a transaction to build out the Novos and um, you know, invest in infrastructure, diversify into new service lines, and execute an add-on acquisition strategy to, to continue to grow uh, inorganically. But with 25 private equity-backed groups competing for transactions and with a trillion dollars of private equity capital that needs to be put to work, um, you know, there are a lot of groups looking to, to do deals and, um, you know, everyone has, has capital, so it comes down to what other resources could you bring to the table to help make this partnership um, worthwhile, um, whether that's, you know, executive leadership that they bring into play, um, maybe it's a business development team to help source transactions or diligence transactions, um, what sort of four-level support can you provide, uh, payer and vendor contracts. Um, Again, with, with all this capital out there and, and increased competition for transactions, um, it's resources outside of capital they are going to differentiate um, certain groups from their peers. And from a shareholder standpoint, um, you know, valuations within the dermatology sector are very aggressive right now just because of the supply and demand imbalance that we touched on earlier. And, you know, doing a transaction now, a lot of shareholders are, are seeing it as a way to monetize their equity in their business. Um, earn a lump sum payment that's taxed at favorable um, tax rate, favorable rates, capital gain rates, um, and you know maybe pay off debt, diversify your wealth a bit, while also having you know a meaningful equity stake 
in a you know very well capitalized company that is set to grow. And you know as the the newly recapitalized company grows, you know your equity will grow alongside that. And you know at some point in the future may have the opportunity to participate in subsequent liquidity events. And just to add on to what Steve mentioned, um, you know there's certainly a lot of um, you know, benefits that uh, go along with pursuing a private equity transaction. It's a reason why we've seen so many deals consummated to date. Um, but on the next slide, we've tried to hone in on, you know, the concerns that groups often grapple with uh, when they're either thinking about a transaction in a favorable light, but also scrutinizing whether or not private equity is an option that uh, makes sense for their organizations. Um, just to, you know, buoy a bit on what Steve mentioned in the previous slide, you know, some of the existing risks that are mitigated in a PE model, which has made transaction activity as robust, in our opinion, um, as it has been, is um, you're able to mitigate some of your risk against reimbursement changes. Um, typically, uh, in all of these transactions, and it, it involves some portion of selling down owner compensation, and while reimbursement has been stable and very attractive over the past several years, um, MACRA and MIPS is certainly something that's on the forefront of you know, every practice's radar. And as uh, reimbursement changes can feed into volatility from a reimbursement perspective, uh, a lot of our clients have sought to uh, sell down their compensation while the compensation levels remain high uh, in order to avoid that reimbursement risk down the road. And really also taking advantage of the uh, a larger organization's bargaining power with respect to the payers and investment into infrastructure that can help optimally position them in more of the risk-based contracting models that are to come. Um, I think another reason for a lot of the private equity investment and transaction trends we've seen from an operator perspective is to uh, hedge against market competition from larger providers. Um, Independent practices, you know, often run into constraints as far as how much they can spend on things like sales and marketing when, um, uh, when you know, there's a lot of competition regionally. They may uh, be hamstrung by their ability to recruit providers, but partnering with a, a financial or strategic organization that has either that infrastructure built in or access to capital to help build out those capabilities in a competitive geography can really create um, some longer term sustainability and uh, ability to compete for independent practices today. And lastly, like Steve mentioned on, you know, kind of existing concerns mitigated in a PE model, uh, an attractive element for operators and shareholders is to uh, align with a capital partner that allows them to forego personal guarantees on any debt used for growth. Um, in all of these transactions, it's typically the debt is typically guaranteed by the company um, and provided either in an equity capital from the private equity firm or access to debt capital that's typically beyond what an independent uh, practice can achieve with their local banking relationships and um, use that capital for growth in more of a risk mitigated way versus having to front that all personally from uh, the, the, uh, the perspective of the shareholders. Um, and also, just from a wealth concentration standpoint, I think you know a lot of um, physicians and shareholders of dermatology practices um, often don't realize how much personal liquidity and wealth is tied up within their practices, given how attractive valuations are today. And so the proceeds of a transaction can really be used to diversify their um, investments, to retire existing practice debt to the extent that there is any, or really from a personal perspective, um, medical school debt for some of the younger shareholders, or really positioning for um, retirement uh, for some of the older shareholders as well. So um, certainly kind of a number of concerns that are mitigated by the PE model um, creating the transaction volume we are seeing today, but we also encourage our clients to look through the lens of um, you know, some of the concerns regarding the PE model and doing their due diligence before deciding whether or not this is uh, the right path for them. Um, you know, really some of the changes that happen under a, a private equity model is a change in governance. Um, private equity firms and strategic organizations have uh, different management structures and investment styles. Um, if you're aligning with a strategic organization that already has for instance, a chief executive officer, a chief medical officer, uh, there'll be a new chain of command um, with respect to 
day-to-day uh, -day operations and really strategic growth. And from the private equity perspective, um, there's a new board of directors that's established and new operating agreements that are structured um, post-transaction, which uh, will certainly influence the, the strategic direction of the overall organization, while typically, you know, medical affairs and uh, patient treatment are left alone um, with respect to a private equity uh, standalone transaction. Um, under the private equity model, there's also revised partner compensation. So any distributions that the shareholders received um, prior to the transaction occurring are typically reinvested into the business moving forward. Um, the, the payback for that is a, a multiple of adjusted EBITDA that's, uh, that we'll get into a little bit further. That's essentially compensation for acquiring the shares within the business. Um, and there's a break-even period that has to make sense for those foregone distributions to equal so many years of uh, transaction proceeds that close. And if um, the shareholders of the organization are uh, essentially distributing all of the income out of the business as, um, you know, P&L uh, salaries for themselves, there's typically an adjustment to shareholder salaries to more of a market rate percentage of collections uh, that allows a, a private equity firm or a strategic organization to really purchase the cash flow of the business moving forward. Lastly, the, the point we wanted to highlight in a PE model that's different than an independent practice is really the intre increased utilization of debt financing. Um, a, a lot of practices that we've encountered uh, typically have low debt or are debt-free in entirety whereas private equity firms will utilize that when investing into their portfolio companies as a way to decrease their risk and increase their returns overall. Um, one risk factor to, to keep in mind is utilizing too much debt um, in acquiring some of these businesses because uh, you, any group wants to make sure that the cash flows within the business can pay down the, the debt in a responsible manner. And so what we've seen um, create successful investments in dermatology is keeping that leverage ratio, as we call it, which is how much debt is used um, to finance the transaction with respect to how much profitability there is in the business uh, to be you know, in line with market standards or um, even conservative in their approach such that uh, debt doesn't really cripple the, uh, the business's ability to, to grow into the future. Moving on to the next section, we'll evaluate transaction structures. And the first slide <clears throat> kind of gives a, a brief high-level overview of how these transactions are structured. And there's, you know, no catch-all structure. They're, they're all different in, um, in, in many ways. But this is the most, pri the most common private equity structure that we've come across. And um, looking at the first column, multiple of adjusted EBITDA, so the transaction or purchase price of the of the transaction will be based on um, a multiple of EBITDA, meaning earnings earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. And so we'll also make adjustments to that EBITDA number um, in, in to uh, provide the foundation of, of the transaction. And so, you know, some of the adjustments that we come across typically are normalizing shareholder compensation to a quote unquote market rate percentage of collections. Um, adding back any, you know, one-time non-recurring expenses or any personal discretionary expenses that are run through the P&L. And once you have your EBITDA calculation, the purchase price is going to be based on a multiple of that EBITDA, as I mentioned. So the multiple is, you know, based on a myriad of, of different factors, you know, some of which we have outlined below. Um, you know, size and scale of the business is important. Some of the, you know, bigger practices will command a higher multiple than you know, smaller businesses. The infrastructure in place is, is very important because these are this is cost that you know, a private equity firm will not have to incur if you know infrastructure is well built out and back office functions are robust. Um, geography, so attractive geographies from a demographic or fragment or fragmented standpoint, is very important to these groups as well as well as growth. So what sort of clip are you growing at, you know, over the last, call it two, three, five years to, um, to command a high multiple? Um, the next column highlights minority versus majority transactions. Majority transactions will be the most commonplace in the vast majority of deals that, that we work on and that have occurred within the dermatology sector. 
So in all these deals, um, groups are looking to acquire 60 to 80% of the business and have the shareholders reinvest or roll over 20 to 40% of their proceeds into the existing platform or into the new MSO that's formed. Um, the reason that majority transactions are more commonplace than minority ones is that there's oftentimes, or in most cases, a reduced buyer pool um, and less potential suitors when, when doing minority transactions. There's also a control premium that's, um, that's fi fi fixed to a majority sale as well, so multiples for minority transactions you know, won't be as high as majority transaction. Uh, taking the aspect of rollover equity um, a little bit further, um, you know, most physician transactions with a private equity group or even a private equity backed group today involve some level of retained ownership for the physician shareholders. And the reason why deals are structured this way is the private equity sponsors want physician shareholders who are really the, the big producers and revenue generators and assets of these businesses to maintain uh, an ownership interest to align everyone's interest moving forward. I think some um, you know, transactions we've seen in the past, especially in the era of you know, the large physician practice management groups was 100% buyouts where um, day one post transaction there wasn't as much of an incentive for the producers to perform the same way they did pre-transaction which really affected the uh, ability of these organizations to grow in the past um, by creating this shared ownership structure and common vision for growth in the business. Uh, private equity groups really want everyone's uh, interest to be aligned in creating a successful outcome for all individuals involved. Uh, most often that rollover equity involves, you know, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of uh, the, uh, the equity being retained by the existing shareholders. Um, there's flexibility around that uh, in terms of which shareholders retain which amounts. Um, it's, you know, to be structured in a way that's tax efficient for everyone, but also uh, addresses, you know, each of the shareholders' goals and motivations out of a transaction. Um, and really, the goal for any private equity transaction is to create a significant upside value where as the private equity firm's um, equity grows in value over time due to the um, uh, capital they're able to invest into the business to facilitate add-on acquisitions and growth um, and infrastructure development, uh, so should the uh, physician's equity or shareholder's equity grow because they're also um, helping create the optimal clinical protocols, um, creating smooth day-to-day -day management of the business and long-term success from a boots-on-the-ground perspective. And really, at the end of the day, there's no true two transactions that are exactly alike. Um, what we found from private equity firms that have been very successful not only in physician services but also dermatology is that um, they're willing to be flexible to meet the need, the need, excuse me, the needs and goals of um, the the practice overall. Um, in terms of how proceeds and equity are, are split, that's certainly. Uh, well, I think one governed by the operating agreements and shareholder agreements of the practice, but certainly can be structured in a way that um, can address the needs of all players involved. And with strategic organizations, if uh, there's a, a practice is growing significantly over time, um, you know, they can structure in things like earnouts to reward a group's uh, near-term growth initiatives. But um, I think at the end of the day, most transactions um, that we've seen and worked on uh, feature most of the, the cash at, at close um, element of the transaction go to the shareholders at the close of the deal. Um, you know, minimal clawbacks or contingent, contingency clauses, et cetera, such that all interests are aligned uh, with the rollover equity uh, to increase the value of the group moving forward. And I think lastly and most importantly is um, that the physicians and day-to-day um, -day operators of the business maintain control of the clinical decisions while uh, interfacing efficiently with um, the board of directors or the, the management team uh, to ensure that the business decisions are also made in a way that's complementary to um, what's being done on a clinical level as well. And moving on to the next slide, um, we highlight here some of the potential transaction strategies that you know business owners, business owners have today within the dermatology uh, sector, and we bucket them out into three categories. 
um, all of which uh, there is a cash proceeds element along with you know reinvested or rollover equity portion as well. And so um, the tiers one and two national consolidators and regional private equity backed platforms are groups that have already taken on private equity investment. You know, they may be in the first iteration or second iteration of of private equity, meaning they may have already gone through a, a secondary transaction where a private equity group um, has exited their position to a larger private equity group. Um, in both of these instances, you know, there's the opportunity to realize synergy, realize synergies um, between the groups, as well as leverage the platform's infrastructure that they already have in place um, and benefit from the growth of the existing platform. So as one of these groups are making acquisitions across the country or in a specific region, your equity is benefiting and set to grow, uh, grow in value through these acquisitions. Tier three private equity platform is, uh, these are groups that are taking on investment from private equity firms that have yet to enter the sector. So these will be uh, platform investments, will be a private equity firm's foray into the dermatology market. Um, you know, we mentioned earlier that there's been an exponential, almost exponential increase in private equity firms that have invested into the sector. So, you know, we do see this um, you know, potentially waning a bit or um, you know, there are certainly less private equity groups that are looking to enter the sector than there were 12 to 18 months ago, as there's now 20, uh, 25 private equity platforms within the market today. Um, but in this case, there is um, cash proceeds at the time of close along with uh, rollover equity into a new established MSO um, where the shareholders of the you know, recently recapitalized business are now the consolidators instead of, instead of joining an existing platform um, and are able to uh, maintain board seats um, and establish new operating and employment agreements which you know, is not the case in joining a, a regional or national, regional platform or national consolidator. On the next slide, we discussed how transactions can be structured to meet the needs of all shareholders involved. Um, you know, we've worked with groups that have as few as, you know, one or two shareholders, but even as large as, um, you know, in, in some physician practice segments, uh, upwards of 100. So um, what's really imperative for any, um, you know, group to consider a transaction with a, a varied range of shareholder ages and motivations is uh, finding a partner that can help um, create a transaction structure that will allow the providers to be happy and incentivized post-transaction. And what we've seen is that for early to mid-career partners in dermatology practices, uh, to keep them happy and incentivized as part of a deal is since they have a longer career trajectory, they may potentially retain more equity um, in the business than their older counterparts, uh, which would allow them to participate meaningfully in multiple transaction events. Um, as we had discussed in, the, uh, in previous slides, the typical uh, private equity investment objective is to um, invest into an organization and uh, grow the value of their investment anywhere from three to five times um, you know, their initial invested capital over a horizon of, call it, three to seven years overall. So for partners that are in the earlier or middle stages of their careers, there's the potential for them to participate in multiple rounds of uh, liquidity through um, each iteration of private equity backing in their organization. And so the, the cash element at close for them, uh, even though it may be smaller since they're rolling more equity, it could be used to uh, either retire medical school debt, pay off mortgages, diversify their uh, portfolios, um, but really create a situation where, um, you know, post-close, they're incentivized not only through their productivity-based model, which is typical uh, in dermatology private equity transactions with salary structured as a, a percentage of um, a percentage of overall collections, but still have um, the value of their rollover equity as a key piece of retaining those individuals longer term. And really from a lifestyle perspective, you know, we often see some early to mid-stage um, partners uh, focus on, uh, use a transaction to allow them to focus on, um, you know, getting back to practicing medicine instead of business or administrative responsibilities and still mitigate some of their risk in terms of 
personal guarantees and the like, but also have the potential to grow within a, a larger organization um, to assume responsibilities if they so choose around medical directorship or uh, even uh, business development or, or executive opportunities as well. Um, I think from a, a later stage career perspective, um, you know, there's the potential for those partners to retain less equity as part of the transaction. Um, some may choose to, to sell 100% of their equity as part of the private equity deal today. And um, there's really flexibility around how much they would like to roll with respect to their um, goals in terms of um, their schedules post-transaction as well. And so for these individuals, a, a transaction event can really diversify their, their wealth and provide personal liquidity ahead of retirement. And in terms of post-close compensation, um, there can really be a, you know, structures unique to their desired roles post-close, whether that's more from a administrative standpoint, whether it's more from a clinical standpoint, um, and offers the opportunity for them to transition into either a part-term or a retirement status uh, as a result of the deal. But really, for all individuals involved, uh, there's the opportunity to, to continue as an owner in the business uh, post transaction with a private equity firm, um, you know, the opportunity for a second liquidity event when their private equity partners look to sell their shares uh, to a larger firm um, and really mitigate risk by taking some chips off the table today while reimbursement is favorable um, and getting multiple years of, you know, their compensation sell down really at a, a capital gains rate versus an ordinary income rate. Um, and still maintain a market rate percentage of collections while getting less uh, exposure to things like market competition uh, as well as changing reimbursement uh, models moving forward. And, you know, really for a transaction to succeed, it's all determined on finding the right partner uh, to align with in any transaction. And so on slide 20, which is the next one we have in our presentation, we um, talk through some various factors to consider as you uh, think about whether a transaction is right or not for your organization. And really from a qualitative perspective, we believe you should focus on some of the, the areas we've highlighted here. Um, I think approach to management is really important. Um, private equity firms and strategic groups all have varied approaches. You know, some are much more hands-on in terms of day-to-day -day management, um, while others are more high-level and allow for greater local governance and, and autonomy. Um, matching their valuations with how life will look like post-transaction is really imperative uh, to creating a successful deal because, as we mentioned in the past, um, dermatology practices, the assets are the physicians and the providers, so if there isn't alignment from a management perspective post-close, um, it really is diff difficult to create long-term value for all stakeholders. Um, what we've also seen is that having related experience is a key determinant of long-term success. So private equity firms that have experience within uh, the physician world can typically bring a, a significant level of experience in helping grow these organizations, but also ensuring that smooth transaction from uh, and transition from being an independent organization to more of a, a sponsor-backed or institutional investor-backed organization. And also getting a good sense of past investment returns is important because, um, you know, those past performances can be good indicators uh, for, um, you know, a company strategy and success from an investment perspective and are key to really maximizing the, the rollover equity value, which, um, as we mentioned previously, is a key element to all of these transactions. We've also found that groups that bring relationships or resources outside of just capital tend to be more successful in terms of um, a return on investment. So, you know, what else are these groups bringing to the table outside of just capital by way of operating partners or infrastructure or board level support, executive leadership? Um, many groups um, are, are flush with capital, and so, um, you know, what other value-added resources can groups bring to the table? The culture and Cultural fit and personality is, is, up, is of utmost importance as well. Um, it is imperative to be, you know, properly aligned in terms of cultural and philosophical fit as, you know, your partner will be partnering with you over the next three, five, seven years. And so um, success is, you know, highly contingent on uh, the alignment of uh, both, part, both parties post-transaction. And so, and, you know, when we run our processes, we will um, you know, host and facilitate management meetings between 
you know, the, the sincere uh, groups at the table looking to bid on um, a given uh, dermatology group. And then conversation with references, there are now, you know, over a couple thousand um, physicians that are a part of a private equity-backed platform, so we encourage you to reach out to, um, you know, past classmates or, or past colleagues to get a sense for what their experience has been like um, as being part of a, of a private equity-backed platform. And so that concludes our section uh, of kind of exploring what a transaction looks like in the, the dermatology market today um, and would like to pass it along to, to Anjana to start speaking about some of the regulatory issues we're seeing in dermatology practice transactions as well. Thanks. Um, from a legal perspective, I'm going to cover basically three areas that I think dermatology uh, groups should be aware of when considering one of these um, sale transactions. One is the due diligence process, just understanding what it is and, you know, what's involved there. Uh, also, some of the common regulatory issues that come up in these transactions. And then lastly, um, preparing for, for these transactions with private equity. And on the next slide, um, you know, just an overview of the due diligence process. As the Provident folks noted in their presentation, the private equity firms are essentially using other people's money to invest in these dermatology practice acquisitions uh, in the hopes that ultimately down the road they, they will get an above market return, right? So if, if they're paying tens of millions of dollars for practice acquisition and sometimes even the nine-figure purchase price um, using someone else's money, then they will want to do a comprehensive review of the group's assets, liabilities, operations, um, risk exposure, and that's why due diligence is very important to private equity buyers. Um, and as part of the process, they'll ask um, for information and documents. They might conduct management interviews. They'll want to look at the financial records, um, not only the financial statements, but also very closely examine billing and coding and, and claims and processing and things like that. Um, they may even ask or, or perform a quality of earnings review as part of that just to test the uh, integrity of the, of the revenue stream. They'll want to look at the organizational documents, basically how are the owners, um, what rights and obligations do they have with respect to each other, litigation, insurance coverage. Um, they'll want to review all the material contracts, um, especially the payer contracts to see the rate structures. Uh, just to identify sort of where the revenue sources are, where the compliance risks are, um, and, and essentially just the basic terms of these contracts. And so there's a lot of information that they're going to request and gather, and ultimately they'll analyze this in information um, with, to basically identify or kind of understand three areas. One is successor liability, uh, essentially what is it that the buyer may potentially inherit in terms of risks and ex exposures, and, and that will help them assess um, and, and come up with risk mitigation strategies going forward. It's also, um, all this information is really going to, uh, they're going to emphasize a lot of compliance-related uh, issues in healthcare, especially with respect to billing and referral arrangements. Um, this is a really sort of potentially a big exposure area that could lead to not only civil and but criminal penalties under the health care laws. So there's going to be a lot of emphasis on, on compliance issues. And then lastly, they want to look at all this information and understand how it will impact the sustainability of revenues going forward. Um, you know, for example, if the group is engaging in aggressive coding practices, you know, how will that impact revenue going forward? So some of the common uh, regulatory issues on the next slide that come up in, in dermatology practice transactions are, you know, billing and coding is always sort of number one. It's, a, it's usually a major area of focus um, because, you know, obviously it goes to revenue generation and ultimately the bottom line, so it is going to be an area of focus. Uh, another area is compliance with the fraud and abuse laws, the Stark law, the anti-kickback law at the federal level, and also um, the state-specific uh, equivalents, if any, uh, that apply. Another area uh, is compensation arrangements, basically not only amongst the owners of the group, how are they paying each other, um, but also how are they, um, how are their financial arrangements structured with 
others like referral sources, vendors, uh, you know, lenders, et cetera. Arrangements with hospitals, um, ambulatory surgery centers, if, if these apply in other physician groups are also going to be scrutinized, um, as well as, you know, licenses and permits, uh, whatever exists for this group, especially if it has a pathology lab, and then um, the existence and implementation of a compliance program is going to be important as well. So moving on on the next slide, in terms of billing and coding, um, this is a major area of focus uh, and scrutiny, both from governmental payers and commercial payers, and some of the common problem areas for physician groups tend to be um, sparsely documented uh, medical records. A lot of times, you know, the documentation is not enough to support medical necessity. The notes might be inadequate, um, and really there's just not enough backup to justify the level of service provided. And so this could lead to payment denials um, at a minimum, or in the worst case, even a government investigation. So that's going to be uh, looked at very closely. Also, utilization review, whether certain um, procedures or services are being overutilized. For example, is the practice billing for certain um, procedures like most surgery in excess of what the industry norm is or, you know, because if they have a pathology lab, are they doing more in-office pathology services than, than before? So those are the kinds of things that will also be looked at. And then lastly, uh, inaccurate coding, this tends to be a sort of a, a problem with physician groups. And, you know, usually with dermatology practices, it's, it's the incorrect modifiers, especially modifier 25 that's uh, used with E&M codes for new patients, which is not permitted. It's only permitted for established patients. Um, and sometimes it's coupled with procedure codes, which is also not um, usually permitted. And then lastly, the new area of focus, uh, or newer, newer area of focus uh, is, you know, how is the group transitioning from ICD-9 to ICD-10? Um, and are there issues there because they're getting denied um, payments uh, because they're not coding properly? So those are the kinds of sort of issues that will be looked at from a billing and coding perspective. Uh, on the next slide, just moving on, compliance with the, the fraud abuse laws is another area, like I said, that will be looked at very closely. Um, Stark law compliance is, is always high on the priority list of due, due diligence concerns um, because it's a law that's very easy to trip up against. And basically, the, the federal Stark law, you know, prohibits physicians from making referrals for certain types of services called designated health services to entities in which the physician or his family member has a financial interest. Um, and, and bills cannot be submitted to a federal health care program unless an exception applies. Um, the key to note here uh, with respect to dermatology is that Stark Law will apply to designated health services and to the extent um, there are clinical lab services involved in the practice, then the Stark Law would apply. Um, we've seen situations where a large group of dermatologists, you know, compensate themselves on the volume of, of specimens that they refer to a dermatologist for whose services they bill, and that can become uh, problematic under the Stark Law. There are exceptions under the Stark Law. The sort of common exceptions are the in-office ancillary services exception and the physician services exception, but you can only take advantage of those exceptions if your practice is something called a quote, group practice, which is a defined term under the Stark Law. It has multiple requirements, but as long as you meet those requirements, um, you can fit into a Stark Law exception. So on the next slide, um, some of the common Stark Law diligence concerns, you know, like I said, is the dermatology group a true group practice? And, you know, meeting the definition of a group practice is obviously beneficial. Um, and it, it especially helps with groups that have multi, multi, multidisciplinary physicians and uh, multiple ancillary services because the group practice definition um, gives the group a, a more leeway in how to split or share profits amongst uh, doctors who refer to each other. So. Ideally, you want to be a group practice so you can take advantage of a, of a Stark exception. And um, to the extent you can't meet the in-office ancillary services exception, then um, the analysis would move on to is there any other exception that would protect the arrangement. Um, and it's important because, like I said, the Stark law is very easy to trip up, trip up against. It's 
um, it's a strict liability law, which means that you have to meet all the elements of an exception. Uh, and, and if you don't, there could be some severe um, penalties from a civil perspective, uh, but also, you know, things like exclusion um, from participation in federal health care programs. On the next slide, I'm trying to identify for you some of the other um, arrangements that would be looked at in due diligence. Uh, in this slide, we, I'm discussing how the shareholders are compensating themselves, how they're paying their employees, how are the mid-levels, the extending extenders, how are they paid, um, but also what are the financial relationships with vendors, um, management or billing companies to the extent the group uses one, hospitals, and uh, referral sources. And, you know, from a fraud and abuse compliance perspective, usually if these arrangements are in writing, they're signed, uh, the compensation is fair market value, and, and, and the whole arrangement is commercially reasonable, then um, you will be able to fit into an applicable exception. The concern here is that if any of these arrangements are, are tainted, um, that could involve uh, potential liabilities not only to you know, a commercial payer or the government, but um, potentially to third parties. And then, you know, the, the, the goal is to kind of understand what's, how does that impact sort of growth and, and profit projections uh, going forward. Because if, for example, some of the arrangements with the referral sources are non-compliant, um, that would obviously affect revenue going forward. On the next slide, um, they will look at arrangements with hospitals and other providers uh, because this is also another area of focus, especially um, by the government enforcement agencies. And that's because some of these arrangements are just sort of low-hanging fruit for the government. Um, and I'm talking about, you know, rentals of space and equipment which are not complying with the Stark Law or medical directorships. Um, and basically this is where this provision of items and services for free or below fair market value going both ways between uh, referral source and referral recipient. And, you know, again, if these, as long as this, these are for bona fide items and services and fair market value, you're usually okay uh, under the fraud and abuse laws. Um, other sort of non-healthcare regulatory diligence concerns uh, with these relationships will be the existence of restrictive covenants or exclusivity provisions in contracts, uh, change of control or change, uh, assignment prohibitions in these contracts which might require consents or approvals before the transaction can be consummated. On the next slide, um, talking a little bit just to the extent the dermatology group has, you know, lab or laser arrangements, you know, a lot of them will be CLIA certified. Uh, you know, there's going to be change of ownership requirements potentially that would have to be looked at um, before the transaction could be closed. And then lastly, on the next slide, um, not but not to the least, is um, whether the group has adopted and fully implemented a compri corporate compliance program. And, um, you know, this is going to be another area that is going to be very important to a PE buyer uh, because they're concerned um, that a lot of physician groups may have, you know, documented a compliance program, but they're not really operationalizing it. So, you know, they might have the paperwork in terms of policies and procedures, but they're not really, um, it's not really a fully functional corporate compliance program. And so they're going to want to ask a lot of questions around this. Uh, they'll want to understand the past areas of concern, what the group did to fix um, any deficiencies, you know, how proactive the group is in, in being on top of these things. Um, and they're especially going to ask about HIPAA, privacy and security, and other cy cybersecurity compliance because healthcare information um, is very valuable in the black market and, and they want to understand what, what steps are being taken to secure it. Um, like, for example, did the group which is cyber insurance um, to help mitigate the risks. So on the next slide, basically the key takeaways, uh, you know, is in trying to prepare for one of these transactions is, is get your house in order, um, be proactive and, and kind of get ahead of the game and avoid issues uh, during negotiations with investors. So, you know, this means detecting and correcting uh, compliance and regulatory risks, which 
should already be part of a, a robust and functioning compliance program. And uh, it's important also not to conceal compliance risks and violations in, in due diligence. Um, a lot of times groups have, have this uh, reaction that, you know, they're not going to disclose things. Um, that could be really, really problematic. You know, it could be down the road that it is discovered and, you know, this could be after spending a lot of time and effort and, and, and money on negotiating a deal. Uh, it could kill the deal. Um, so, you know, just you just have to understand there are ways to disclose sensitive compliance issues between a buyer and a seller, whether it's through confidentiality agreements or what's known as a common interest agreement, which is really a, a joint privilege agreement. And there are also ways to address the risk, depending on, on the level of the risks, um, whether it's through indemnification, uh, reps and warranty insurance, escrows, holdbacks. Uh, there are ways to kind of negotiate um, around healthcare risks because at the end of the day, uh, it's very hard for any practice to be 100% compliant um, in a highly regulated industry like, like healthcare. On the next slide, just just talking a little bit, and I won't get into much detail on what I call reverse due diligence. Um, this is basically the practice asking uh, questions of the of the PE investor because they want to go in with their eyes open. And you know, Providence uh, slide number 19 actually touched on this, so I won't get into details. But you know, it's things like speaking with other physicians, you know, who have gone through some of these types of strategic transactions and, and getting their input. Um, but you know, you know, asking about uh, the success of the PE buyer, you know, in terms of sort of growth and profitability and, and things like that. And then lastly, on the next slide, um, you know, transaction structures. Uh, AJ and Steve touched upon it from the perspective of, of the financial, um, how to structure these things. But you know, from a legal perspective. You know, to the extent it's a platform deal, that usually is a lot more work because there's a lot of restructuring that has to happen to split out all the non-clinical uh, personnel and assets from the physician group into the management services company. Um, so that's, that is a lot more work. Um, but to the extent it's, it's an add-on acquisition, um, that's, that's less likely to require restructuring um, and less work overall from a legal perspective. So with that, um, let me just turn it over to questions, uh, if we have time, Whitney. Yes, so we are just a little bit over time, but if there are questions, I want to take this opportunity to remind folks that you can submit those uh, via the Q&A. And um, given the timing, maybe we, we just answered two or three today, but um, outside of that, the speaker information is displayed on the screen, so please feel free to reach out to any of today's speakers to follow up on specific questions you may have. It look, looks like one of the questions that we've received is how long consolidation will last for. And, you know, we, we briefly touched on this um, in that um, you're detailing the nature of consolidation and, we, and that we expect, you know, less private equity investors to enter the market uh, in terms of platform deals. but expect add-on acquisition activity to continue to pick up as there are, you know, 25 groups that are 25 plus groups that are competing for deals. We also do anticipate, you know, more secondary transactions occurring, meaning that, you know, a private equity group exits their investment in a platform to a larger private equity group because there are, you know, there's a vast ecosystem of private equity groups. Um, we're dealing with just, you know, the lower middle market, so there are much larger groups that are, um, you know, not even looking at the size of the transactions that have occurred within the dermatology sector just because they don't fit their, you know, corporate mandated threshold in terms of, in terms of size. So, you know, we anticipate consolidation lasting for a while, just looking a lot different in the future. <laughs> Yeah, and I'd say just to add to that, the valuation environment has been very attractive today uh, because debt 
which is used to finance these transactions is still relatively easy to access and, and cheap in nature. Um, so one thing that we're keeping our eyes on is just the interest rate policy that's um, going to affect how these deals are valued down the road, um, as well as macroeconomic factors like reimbursement. Uh, if there's, you know, let's say cuts to um, things like MOs or, or pathology in a meaningful way that could reduce the overall income to uh, physician practices, I think that will affect how many deals private equity groups choose to do in dermatology and uh, for add-on acquisitions as well. So um, I think for the time being, absent those factors from a macroeconomic scale, we still believe that the valuation environment will continue uh, to create transaction volume, um, but there's the potential that um, you know, some of these macroeconomic factors uh, related to interest rates and reimbursement and things like that uh, may you know, affect how many deals are, are getting done in the near future also. I think the, the second question that came up was, um, what's the single most important thing I can do to prepare my company for a, a transaction process? Um, I think what we always, um, try to bucket this into is uh, from kind of a motivations perspective and then also from a nuts and bolts perspective. I think from a motivation perspective, it's important that all of the shareholders in the business are on board with at least exploring what a, a transaction could look like. Um, I think one of the reasons we see deals fall apart is that um, the motivations for the shareholders aren't quite aligned with respect to transacting with a private equity firm or strategic partner. Uh, perhaps the reasons why they get into a transaction um, aren't really uh, what's available in the market in terms of um, resources afforded post-transaction or, or liquidity um, afforded during the transaction process. Um, and I, I think in terms of a, a nuts and bolts perspective, um, you know, Anjana touched upon a lot of the legal um, aspects of making sure that your, your compliance program is in order because that can derail um, a due diligence process. I think from a financial perspective, um, having um, you know, a, a qualified third party look at um, the financials of the business to determine you know, appropriate add backs to adjust the EBITDA and setting reasonable expectations for what uh, valuations could look like for a, a particular organization are also important. Uh, but I think ultimately um, you know, a lot of it also comes down to just everyone's motivations and going through a process and making sure that interests are aligned from that perspective. Okay, great. Uh, so I think, you know, since we're already over time, we'll wrap it up with that as the last question. However, again, if attendees have any additional questions, please follow up with today's speakers. Uh, that does con conclude today's webinar. I'd like to thank our speakers for joining us and all the attendees for attending as well. Have a great day.